Chapter 4 A ridge of hills ran behind the town of Hambly, about half a kilometre inland. The town itself was built around a small but well-protected harbour. On the northern breakwater, Will could see a large metal framework, some six metres in height. That's the real beacon, Holtz told him, noticing his interested gaze. It's lit every night and it shows any approaching ship where the north breakwater is and gives them a steering point. But, as you can see, the tall headland behind it hides it from the view of any ship coming down the coast until the ship is only half a kilometre away. They were lying on their bellies at the top of the ridge of hills overlooking the town. The horses were back on the far side of the ridge, out of sight. The two rangers, lying prone and concealed by their cloaks, would be invisible to anyone within 50 metres, let alone half a kilometre. Now, look further north, Holt said, and Will obediently shifted his point of view. Beyond the headland, a curving strip of beach swept north, ending in another, slightly lower headland. My guess is, that's where they'll build the false beacon. You can see how the water is shallow for several hundred metres out from the beach. Any ship turning in there, thinking they've found the harbour, will be on the sand before they know it. I imagine the wreckers will set up spot fires and lanterns on the low ground behind the beach so it'll look like the town. The ship's captain will see what he expects to see, a beacon and a township. But it'll be a kilometre further north than the real one. This ridge of hills we're on will create a dark backdrop. Someone looking out to sea will see the lights against the darkness. They won't see the details. He rubbed his jaw thoughtfully, brushing away an ant that had ventured to explore his beard. That shallow sandy bottom will suit them admirably. The ship will be stuck on it, but unless there's really bad weather, she won't break up. That means the moon darkers can wade out at low tide and unload her at their leisure. And they'll get all the cargo, instead of losing some as it's washed away. Will glanced sideways at the grey-bearded ranger. You seem to know a lot about how they work, Holt. Holt nodded grimly. Moondarking was a blight on this nation during the first war with Morgoth, he said. The king's troops were too preoccupied with the rebellion to attend to other matters. And you know how quickly criminals will take advantage of a situation like that. Will nodded. So, how did you stamp them out? Oh, after the war, Crowley and I mounted a bit of a campaign against them. After a while, they seemed to decide that Araluen wasn't the best place to go moondarking. Most of them moved on to Gallica, where conditions were more conducive to their trade. Most of them? Will asked. What about the others? They stayed here, Holt said grimly. You'll find their graves up and down the west coast, if you look closely. You and Crowley were quite a team in the early days, weren't you? Will asked. A ghost of a smile touched Holt's mouth. We had our moments, he said. Then he began to slither back from the top of the ridge, staying low until he could stand without being skylined to any observer below them. Will followed and looked expectantly to his old teacher for orders. We'll head north towards that beach, Holt said. We'll camp on the ridge and keep watch for any activity on the headland or on the low ground inland from the beach. You're sure that's where they'll set up? Will said. Holt shrugged. You can never be sure of anything, but it's the most logical place. Any further north and they'd be too far away from Hambly itself. Besides, the coastline curves in to the east up there, so the whole topography is different. This spot is close enough to the real town to confuse any skipper who's not on his toes. We'll scout through the woods as well, to see if we can find their camp. If they're in the area, they shouldn't be too hard to find. They won't be trying to remain hidden the way we will be, and it'll be a big camp. You said there could be 15 to 20 of them, Will began. That's right, and they'll need carts and horses to carry away the cargo, so the camp will be a big one. Can we handle that many? Will asked tentatively. Holt looked steadily at him. These men are cold-blooded murderers, he said. 
but they're not warriors. They'll get one warning to surrender, then we start shooting. Crowley and I handled this many, it shouldn't be a problem. That was Crowley and you, Will said. He was surprised by Holt's answer. You're better than Crowley. Will would have been even more surprised if Holt had added what was in his mind. You're probably better than me too. They struck north and set up a small, well-concealed camp in a thicket of trees on the inland slope of the ridge. Abelard and Tug were unsaddled and left to graze close to the camp. If by chance they were discovered, their shaggy coats and lack of saddles or bridles would probably lead their discoverers to assume they were wild ponies. There were numbers of those roaming the hills in small groups. There would be no campfire, and the two rangers sighed as they resigned themselves to a diet of cold water and hard rations for the duration of the mission. They set up an observation post on the ridge, digging a shallow pit, then roofing it over with dirt, branches and leaves, so that they could watch the beach and the headland unobserved. It was not unlike the sort of hide that hunters built, Will thought. Then he smiled grimly as he realised they were hunters, but they were hunting men. There were still a few hours of daylight left when they finished. Holt gestured to the pit. Keep an eye on things, he said. I'm going to scout around and see if I can find any sign of a camp. Will nodded. A camp would confirm that they were on the right track. After all, they were still working off information received from the anonymous informant. It could well be a wild goose chase, but one of the first things a ranger learned was to watch and listen patiently for hours or days on end. Will moved in a crouch to the observation post, which was on the slope of the ridge overlooking the beach, and crept inside. He settled down, made himself comfortable, and leaned back against the dirt wall. They had left a slit that ran the entire width of the hide, and... As he sat back in the deep shadows, he had an uninterrupted view of the headland and beach. He reached into the satchel he had slung over one shoulder and took out paper, pen and a small travelling inkwell. The draft of his speech was in there too, but for the moment he would content himself with noting down impressive phrases to include in it. He could do that while keeping a keen eye on the beach below him. Reading or rewriting the speech would be too much of a distraction. But jotting down the odd descriptive phrase would only take a second or two at a time. One such came to mind, a description of Horace and Evelyn, and he quickly unscrewed the inkwell, dipped in his pen, and jotted it down. The much-beloved boon companions of my tender youthful years, he wrote, and muttered to himself, Oh, that's good, very good. He scanned the beach and the headland again, but nothing was moving. Then he jotted down another phrase. It is with prideful joy that I have the temerity to add my unstinting adulation to what has already been avowed before this eminent assemblage. I do like that very much, he said to himself. He sighed happily and leaned back against the earth wall of the pit waiting for further inspiration to strike. It took Holt less than two hours to find the camp. Not surprisingly, it was the smell of wood smoke that first alerted him to the presence of people in the woods. It was faint at first, but as he followed in the direction from which the light breeze was blowing, it became stronger. Then he began to notice other signs. A dog barked. Then he heard the ring of an axe on wood. The sounds and smells took him back over the ridgeline, into the woods on the seaward side. Eventually, he found himself looking down into a cleared hollow in the trees. There were half a dozen tents pitched in a neat group, and several cooking fires were already lit. Off to one side, four solid-wheeled carts were parked. Beyond them, he could make out horses tethered among the trees. People moved about the campsite, talking and calling to one another. There was no real attempt at concealment, 
as there was nobody to remain concealed from, so far as the Moondarkers were concerned. He counted the people he could see, sixteen of them, and all men, he noted. And that last fact was further confirmation that this was a Moondarkers camp. He watched for a few minutes as several of them began to prepare the evening meal. His stomach complained quietly as the delicious aroma of meat roasting over the fires wafted around him. He silently withdrew from his vantage point. Nothing to do here but get hungry, he murmured to himself, and headed back to the smoke-free, roasted meat-free camp hidden on the reverse slope. He thought about what his dinner would be, cold water, dried meat and fruit, and hard bread. The thought didn't make him any more kindly disposed towards the moondarkers.